Welcome to the No Unfinished Business Podcast. There are a thousand different ways your clients can leave unfinished business, but no single advisor can address every issue. In every episode, we'll answer the important questions to help professional advisors focused on individual clients, attorneys, CPAs, and financial advisors, identify and eliminate those planning blind spots so you can speak competently and confidently to your clients and help them leave no unfinished business. Ever Widener, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you for having me, John. So we're talking about something that comes up a lot with business owners. What is my company worth? Mm -hmm. You, thankfully, are here because you do this all the time. So Mm -hmm. just broad overview, what's involved? Why do we even care about having you know, valuations beyond 3x multiple of some formula? That's a good question. So I think the overall benefit of having uh, a business valuation done by a person who does them for a living is basically information. Like you just said, a lot of business owners are so in in the weeds of their business. And, you know, the business owners I work with, brilliant people, they're super busy, And so when they think about the value of their business, they think of it in terms of maybe a multiple that their, you know, buddy sold his company for or her company for, right? And so they don't have time to think about it. And so they they might think that their business is worth something based on a multiple of some value driver like EBITDA or revenue. But in reality, that might not be the case. And so they could be grossly over underestimating what their value is of their business. So having an outside appraiser come in and giving an objective, credible number just gives them information to plan. And and really, that's the value of it. Right. You know, a lot of times when we're setting up companies, when I've worked on this in the past, setting up multiple people, the issue of valuation comes up because the business owners want to know if one of us dies or quits or Mm -hmm. just wants out. We need to have some sort of back-end protection that we're just not going to get, you know, a dollar for this. Right. And that's where, you know, it's like, oh, well, we'll just do three times EBITDA and be done with it. We don't have to think about it. This is a formula. (laughs) Yeah. That that no one laughed. Why don't you just say what you're Well, as as you were saying that, I was thinking I'm actually working on two appraisals right now that have formulas in their buy-sell agreement that the person who wants to be bought out is not okay with that and because they know what that that's going to come to and they know their value is worth something else. So most times we want to see a buy sell agreement that says, you know, a third party appraiser is going to come up with that fair market value of that company. Right. And I mean, do you want them starting with third party appraiser because the companies I'm setting up are usually family held like it's mom and dad or mm-hmm. putting stuff together. So it's not that we don't think about it, but it's less of a driver because the only way people are getting out is by death. Right. Uh, But thinking back to the days when I did more corporate work, we generally have some formula. And if somebody didn't like it, Mm -hmm. that's when you could go to one appraiser, three appraisers. Right. You know, everybody submits one and Mm -hmm. then we either average or do do something to find, you know, smooth out the hard edges. Uh Uh Um, Yeah, I would say at least in my experience, what I've seen is that when it has a formula, typically, if that was used, maybe in we'll call business generation one, maybe Mm -hmm. that worked out. Maybe that's how they did it. But it could have put the company in a bind because they they had to buy out maybe at a value that was too high. And so then is that the expectation for everybody else? It can cause a lot of problems, the formula can. So when we get a third party appraiser in, we're actually valuing it at fair market value in the appropriate methods that are done by all appraisers in the industry. So it's preferable to have it that way. Right. And, you know, before we get into what is done commonly in the industry, because it does ma- matter, I've seen some very bad appraisals <laughs> in the past, but just thinking through, like, one of the reasons we get it is we know what to buy you out at. Because the downstream of that is we're going to go buy company-owned life insurance on mm-hmm. people right. so to make sure that we can buy them out. And either we're going to be way off in one direction. The problem is, one, what if we buy too much insurance mm-hmm. and we just have all this extra, extra money, which Absolutely. is not a bad problem. Mm-hmm. But the other side, the, down, the real downside is 
we're going to buy out the deceased shareholder mm -hmm. who now we've got a cash crunch in the company because we didn't appraise, didn't know how much money we actually needed to buy those shares out. Absolutely. Yeah. 100%. So definitely the way to go, have the appraisal, have it on the front end so that you can plan for, for how much in, in insurance you need exactly. I mean, buy, sell, and insurance is so important that planning for that as well. So Amber, with all of these choices for appraisers in the market, how do we know we're getting somebody who can actually do the job correctly? Right. That's a good question. So what you want to look for for a business appraiser is you want to find somebody who does it full time and exclusively. There are CPAs or CFAs, people that are professionally qualified that will do valuations for their clients, maybe for a specific reason, but maybe they're only doing one or two a year. And so I would look for someone who does them exclusively and also somebody that has business valuation accreditations. So for example, I am a CPA, but I also have an ABV accredited in business valuation that's issued through the AICPA that kind of goes along with my CPA license. I'm also an ASA, which is an accredited senior appraiser. And there's other accreditations, a CVA and such. So that's what I would look for. And the reason being is that the people who have those accreditations, their professional standards are going to produce reports and methodologies that are going to that are going to meet standards, like for example, IRS standards for adequate disclosure and things like that. So, so you know you're getting somebody who's following a professional standard, following methods that are acceptable and best practice in, in the field, and are also going to produce a credible, defensible opinion. Oh, good. And thinking back to a time when I got an appraisal for a business interest, the company and, or the comparable companies, among others, had listed, uh, the appraiser had listed Nestle as mm -hmm. a comparable company. Now, our target interest was not a chocolate company, was not a candy company, was not a <laughs> multinational. And it, like it just, he, they had left in this comparison report mm -hmm. of Nestle. Okay. Beyond kind of the simple things of just looking through, does this appraisal make sense? If we found out for one reason or another, we've been, we've got an appraiser who is not as good as we need them to be. Is there anything that you know, the attorneys, the CPAs, the, you know, the folks who are going to be reporting these, can do to help guide this appraiser to make sure that we're getting exactly what we need. Sure. So I would, in that instance, well, I, I think it's important to point out that you will always get what you pay for in appraisals. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure in your industry, you feel that in the same way. True. Um, because there are, there are, companies that you can just put in your information and it spits something out, right? right. And, and I don't know if that was the case for, for your situation. But what I would say is ask for a draft first before anything is issued. That way you can read over the report and see outliers and things that should not be in there that might be an like a just a error that was overlooked. So ask for a draft, read it over, have the discussion with the appraiser, and ask questions. You know, I always like when attorneys and wealth advisors or business owners ask me a lot of questions that want to understand the analysis because then it cuts back if there's ever, you know, if it goes under audit or things like that, you're a team and you know what you presented and so that you can work together to, right. to rebuttal that. Right. And, you know, and you'd mentioned this before, getting into adequate disclosure, we can't just turn in, I think this is what this is worth to the IRS for... You know, I'm thinking about estate and gift tax valuations, but for any other transaction, we want to make sure that we've complied with what the IRS is looking for. Absolutely. It's not just the magic words. Right. But I've found that when I've gotten appraisal reports that don't have the magic words at the beginning, mm -hmm. it's almost the precursor to, I'm going to have a lot more questions for <laughs> okay. this appraiser right. later on. Because if they don't know, you know what, it, I'm not going to be able to recite the words right, <laughs> right. now. But they're written down. They're, those are the easy things. So a bit about, you know, how do, how do you make sure that the IRS is getting what they're, they're looking for? Right. So we follow, um, being an ASA, we follow USPAP. And being a, an ABV, we follow the AICPA SSBS. So those professional standards give you a framework for what needs to be provided. And 
what is in our professional standards is basically what the IRS needs. The IRS wants to know, you know, certain just key points, like what's the effective date? What's the valuation date? What's the premise of value, which is going to be fair market value for tax compliance purposes. But there needs to be a detailed explanation of the methodology and the analysis that went into formulating the value. And so the way in which we write our reports provides that explanation and that disclosure to the IRS. You know, and in terms of uh, buy sell even, you know, a lot of times you want to make sure you have a full appraisal that explains it. I mean, if money is trading hands, you you want to provide provide that detail to whoever is buying in or being bought out. Right. So, yeah, the, it's, it's the professional standards that really guide what we do. Got it. And so, I mean, it, it does it. When we're looking at those professional standards, when I've got a draft report from an appraiser, should I bring up those standards or is there an outline we'd want to look at and say, all right, well, you have not done step 3C of this to, you know, not so much throw it back in the appraiser's face, but mm-hmm. just to make sure you know you've got a framework for what their framework should be. Mm-hmm. I would say in terms of, I mean, I'm sure you're really busy. I mean, so <laughs> so going in and, and babysitting your professionals that you hire um, probably is not a good use of your time. So I would say... Hiring somebody that has those accreditations, that has a good reputation, that's been doing this work for numerous years, is going to probably meet the standards that that their profession, you know, says they must and that, that you require as well. Right. So. Well, good. And to get down to the last part, part of this, the value is never exactly what the value is. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we want the value to be higher because we're looking to grow the business or sell it. Mm -hmm. How can we get more money from a buyer? Sometimes we want it to be lower because for estate and gift tax purposes, we're trying to minimize how much credit we're using. Mm -hmm. Let's start with discounting. This is what comes up a lot for estate planners. How do we make this gift without spending too much of our credit? Okay. What sort of discounts do you normally look at? What do you think is within the realm of what people should I don't want to say expect to just say, well, you know, between 20 and 30 percent, this is what you should expect to get for lack of control. Right. Because right. you're the expert on this. You mm-hmm. tell me, like, what do you see? How What's within the realm of possibilities? Mm-hmm. And just just to kind of reframe some of that that question is important. There are different purposes for appraisals, for sure. But what an appraiser is going to provide, it, it's is not going to it's a credible opinion of value. An, an appraiser is not going to try to make the value higher or lower. It's just that there are, in estate planning, for example, when you are gifting a minority uh, non-marketable interest, there are economic realities of that interest that that decrease the value on a per rata basis, right? Right. So I just kind of wanted to clarify that. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm just being blunt. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, but I'm sure business owners or whoever, I, they might be thinking in that terms. But as an appraiser, I'm going to get to a credible value. So for gift tax, for instance, what we were just saying, for a minority non-marketable basis, what we do is we value the business at 100% control marketable And then we apply what are called valuation discounts. So there's going to be discount for lack of control and discount for lack of marketability associated with that. And you want to make sure when you're seeing the appraiser's report, you want to make sure that those discounts are adequately supported and the methods which they were formulated are well supported in the appraisal. We usually, for our discount for lack of control, we we look at the cash flows of the company on a non-controlling basis. So we don't actually apply a an empirical discount for lack of control. We look at the cash flows. And when we look at a discount for lack of marketability, we look at usually three different methods to formulate that discount as well. Okay. One of the things I've always wondered, haven't asked an appraiser recently, if you have a business, you know, we're going to start with 100% value. Mm-hmm. If we break it up and assume this company, we're going to value it 90 and 90% and 10%. Mm-hmm. Should those 90 and 10% interests, after you apply the discount, still add up to the same 100% value? No. It, valuation is interesting that like 
two and two doesn't equal four because the pro rata amount is being discounted in such a way that it doesn't work that way because the 90% is going, it's, it may not even have any discounts. Okay. And so the 10% might have substantial discounts based on, you know, the documents that you draft, how you draft them. That's where I get my support for my discounts. It's, it's going to be discounted. So it's pro rata share is not going to be the same as the 90%. Okay. So, and even if you were to put some control premiums, maybe on the 90%. Um, there's a lot of, debate about control premium. So okay. it just depends. It depends. I mean, that that's a good point. That depends on the appraiser. So okay. yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> so those are times where we're, we're expecting a lower than just pro rata percentage of value. Right. Other times we're looking to get the value as high as we can within reason. Obviously, the, by the time you're brought in, mm -hmm. there's nothing they can really do to, you know, shove money in <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> into the valuation. <laughs> right. But what should business owners, advisors be thinking about now? What should people do to raise the value of that business? Mm -hmm. So we, we're having a lot of business owners right now looking to sell in the next several years. And so, so what we're helping them do is come up with a credible value as a baseline value. And then we're looking at various KPIs and helping them see where they can improve within reason, you know, over the next five years to really increase value. You know, we had a deal fall through because inventory, they, they couldn't agree on it. They couldn't get a good solid feel for, the, for that number. And had we have gotten out, you know, in front of that, we could have helped. So what business owners, to answer your question, need to look at is really planning and saying, hey, I want to get in front of this liquidity event so that I can get top dollar for my my company that I probably put my heart and soul into. Because what we see a lot of times is, you know, someone gets ill or there's a life event and they need to sell or they need a liquidity event and there's not enough time to really work on those, you know, work on increasing margins, work on reducing risk, those sort of things. But if we can get out in front of that, we have time to do things such as, you know, clean up your books and maybe get a review or an audit done, maybe a quality of earnings report, those types of things so that we can add credibility to our numbers and actually even increase margins and reduce risk to get that value up when it is time to sell. Right. So thinking about the appraisal years before you're actually going to sell mm -hmm. because it's going to force you to again, clean up the books, yep. make sure you're ready to actually sell, right. not doing the normal cleanup that I remember of, oh, we've got a deal. Wait a minute, the books don't line up. We're <laughs> going to spend, you know, months right. trying to reconcile everything. Yes. It's not, you're just not going to get top dollar for that. And you're also going, the, the buyer is not going to feel real good about what else is going on in the company. If things aren't buttoned up, if you don't have all of the answers to the questions that they're asking. So, so getting an appraisal or even a calculation, which is kind of like an appraisal light, done to get a baseline value. So what we do we for clients is we will provide that. Then we do an advisory session where we talk about these KPIs. We do some scenario analyses. And then what we can also do is track value. So if we're five years out, we can say, hey, you know, value year one, two, three, four, five. And so you're providing a potential buyer with, with a value trend. And we probably ask a lot of questions that a buyer is going to ask. So you've kind of cleaned out all the, the mess so that you know the answer and you feel confident and you just create a lot of confidence in the business that, that you're putting out there. Yeah. To, to slowly land the plane here, you, you mentioned risk and it's interesting because as an attorney, the, you know, the risks inherent in acquiring a practice or thinking about it as a lawyer for another lawyer, like it's nothing but risk. There are no fixed assets in a law firm. There are, you know, the, the continuing business is minimal at best. Mm -hmm. It is almost nothing but I'm buying some paperwork and maybe your old office lease. Right, right. Nothing but, right. <laughs> nothing but risk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very yeah. true. Very yeah. true. And, and that's a good point. Businesses differ and professional services differ than a manufacturing. So, and the way they're looked at in terms of valuation will differ as well. So, yeah. yeah. Excellent. Well, Amber, uh, this is a good place to leave us for now. Thanks so much for coming by. 
for our listeners, what watchwords should they be listening for from their clients to know it's time for an appraisal? Um, when they start to say, hey, I'm, I'm thinking about selling, obviously, or I really want to reward my employees and kind of get them to have some skin in the game because I'm worried about retention or I want to um, start to formulate a succession plan. I think those are kind of indications when they when when a trusted advisor starts to see a business owner tire of the business, kind of see that spark go out or is just not really into it. I think that that's kind of a sign that, hey, there's because once that starts to happen and business owners start to kind of mentally exit, value is going to go down because presumably margins could go down if people aren't really paying attention. So I think trusted advisors kind of just need to trust their gut and kind of see when they start to see those shifts. Excellent. Amber, where can people find you? They can find me on LinkedIn, Amber Widener. I also, my company is Seidel Schrader and it's sscpa.com. Excellent. Thanks so much for coming by. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening. You can find more episodes, videos, and links to more helpful content at nounfinishedbusiness.com. If you have any questions, feedback, or ideas for topics, please reach out via social media or email john at john at strohmeyerlaw.com. And of course, if you or your clients need help from John with an estate planning, probate, trust, or cross-border tax issue, you can book time directly with John at askjohnaquestion.com. 